You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. This episode is sponsored by Demand Derivatives, a startup futures exchange and clearinghouse trading the world's major assets in a creative new way. You already trade on an exchange. Here is your chance to own one. Before they approach large strategic partners for funding, the pioneering team at Demand Derivatives launched a crowdfunding portal so that regular traders have the chance to buy shares. Learn more and become a part of this revolutionary fintech project now at demandderivatives.com slash crowdfunding. You wanted it, you got it. A radio program that helps teach you options trading inside and out, basic to complex. This is Options Bootcamp. Whether you want to learn how to protect your portfolio, generate income, or even become a master of volatility, the Options Bootcamp drill instructors will break it all down for you. Now, let's get you into peak options trading shape. Here are your Options Bootcamp drill instructors. All right, everybody. That music means it is Education Wednesday time once again. For Options Bootcamp, the premier educational program out there for all you folks. Maybe you're a stock trader and thinking about dipping those toes into the options waters. Maybe you're one of the legion of first-time options traders that really hit the market en masse last year in 2020. You want to learn how to turn that trading up to 11. Either way, we got you covered here on Options Bootcamp. My name is Mark Longo from the optionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever-exciting Options Insider Radio Network. Remind me, if you like what you hear, this show, we do a lot of other shows on the network. So first off, if you're just listening to Boot Camp, you're missing out on a ton. So get over there, wherever you're listening, Apple Podcasts, could be Amazon Music these days, could be Spotify, wherever you get our show. And make sure you upgrade to the full network. It's all free. <laughs> and you could, of course, uh, check out all that content. You're getting a couple shows a day, pretty much. So we'll keep you engaged, informed, on the world of options. If you like what you hear, keep rating and reviewing. And for those of you who want more, you're always asking us, hey, what more do you guys have? What more do you got? We have, we have more in the works. So stay tuned, listeners. Coming this spring, probably, if we can get all of our ducks in a row, some additional fun stuff for you listeners out there. Thank you, folks, of options. Boot camp will definitely get a thrill out of it. And of course, keep those questions and comments coming too. We do love to hear from all of you guys and gals out there. And let's see who we're hearing from on the old program today. Ah, uh, yes, I am pleased to say, that I am joined once again by the black-hatted one himself, a.k.a. the founder of Market Taker Mentoring, a.k.a. the author of one or two options-oriented tomes, Mr. Dan Passarelli. Mr. P, welcome back to Options Boot Camp, sir. It is always good to be back at boot camp, sir, uh, you know, like when you join the actual military, like, don't you just go through boot camp once? I, I mean, I don't know. I, I wasn't uh, ever in the military, but gee, I feel like I've been doing boot camp for a long time. <laughs> that just shows how much more difficult it is. It, boot camp never ends, sir. There's always training to be done and always learning to be done. So let's do a little bit of the old basic training. All right, boot, it's time to get live. What you're going to do is learn. You're going to learn how options work. Do you hear me? 
You're going to learn options trading inside and out, basic to complex. There will be no failures, do you hear me? Yes, sir! Hold in, print bear to learn. Yes, sir! All right, everybody, welcome to the basic training, the portion of the show where we break down some basic options concept or strategy or technique and explain how you can incorporate it into your own portfolio. We also talk about products. And we're going to get to that today. Before we do that, really quickly, I know, Dan, lots has been lighting up your tape over there in the land of MTM. I'm sure your clients and customers are coming to you. A lot of, a lot of interesting topics. I'm curious for you, as we're in this weird state of flux in the market, you know, balls coming up, balls coming down, mostly the latter of late these days. Market's kind of vacillating. We just had the Fed, of course, today. What's, what's lighting up your tape from an overall markets and volatility and a devaluation perspective these days, sir? I've been looking at a lot of stuff. You know, I've been looking at um, what's trading, you know, like um, we refer to it sometimes as unusual activity, uh, just some of the bigger trades. And I've been really focusing on that a lot lately. Um, and it's been interesting. Sometimes I follow along with it. Uh, sometimes I don't. And sometimes I actually take the other side. Yes, there is a lot of fun to be had looking at and analyzing and trading around unusual activity. We do a lot of that on our network, including our option block program listeners. We have a whole segment called the odd block where we kind of break down all things unusual and talking about what's coming to the network. Maybe more of that coming in the near future. So stay tuned. But today's topic, Dan, as we are wont to do, we are subject to the whims of our audience, of our listeners at the end of the day. And we got deluge and we touched on this a little bit. On our last show, and we had a, a question, I think, on this topic, but people have just deluged us even more since. They're kind of in a tizzy about all things small, Dan. In particular, mini options, maybe a little bit of fractional. We'll get to that a little bit later, maybe, as well. We got a bunch of questions. I'll just grab a couple here to set the theme for what we're going to talk about here. This first one's from Nicholas. He says, I'm curious as to Mark and Dan's thoughts on the relisting of mini options in 2021. A Beetle Bub follows up similar question. Are mini options currently trading? I'm hearing a lot about them, but don't see them available on my trading screen. And Ableton saying, you said many options were delisted, but I'm currently trading options on the E-mini S&P 500. What gives? Uh, you know, Dan, a lot of misconceptions, a lot of things to clarify. This is clearly a hot topic right now and maybe going to be an even more hot topic to come this year. But I'm curious. Let's set the stage. What are your thoughts on mini options? What do you remember from the first foray of all things mini and what do you want to correct about some of these misperceptions people have here about what the heck a mini option is versus what they're trading right now, like the e-mini, sir? Well, yeah. So mini options, when they were listed on the exchanges, they were just kind of smaller versions because, you know, one of the things that attracts people to options, uh, especially people who are just starting out uh, who have smaller accounts, is, oh, well, I can buy a call for a tenth of the value of a stock. Uh, and, and that's great. But then you're looking at a stock like Amazon and you're like, holy crap, I, I can't even afford the options. And so some of those stocks had options that were a tenth the size that just, well, I guess uh, to, to use the word that everybody loves to use, democratized it a little bit more. And um and it made it interesting, but it never really caught on. No, it didn't. So let's set the stage here. Maybe we should start by just delineating even more what the heck we're talking about. Obviously, Ableton and a few others are confused. They see things like E-minis and everything else out there. Yes, there are some smaller one-tenth size contracts and even smaller size contracts trading on certain venues. Primarily now you're looking at some of the futures options products over there on CME. CME has the E-mini which are the futures and the options, of course. Those are one-tenth size. They now have introduced micro, which are even smaller. <laughs> so they keep getting smaller over there at CME. So on the futures and futures options front, you have an array of choices when it comes to bite size type contracts. What we're talking about are the types of products most of the listeners of this show are interested in, which are the single name equity options primarily. I mean, some index as well, but primarily you folks are into the Apples and the Teslas and the Googs and the Facebooks and the games and everything else out there that's trading hot and heavy. It's hard to blame you. These things are moving out there. So that's where we're focusing our conversation. And for that perspective, this has been done before. That's what we referred to on our last show. And these were done back in the crazy dark days, Dan. So Dan, it's hard to believe it was 2013 when they launched, but it was that long ago. Does it seem like more recent than that, doesn't it? Yeah, it, doesn't it? I mean, time flies when you're having fun, you know? 
Yeah, that's one of the benefits, listeners, of getting your content from a network like this that's been around the option space for a while. We were live. We were talking about these many things back when they came out. At the time, we were doing our interview show as we like to do at all the various conferences and events around the country and talking to the various leadership of exchanges and brokers and trading firms, everything else under the sun in the option space. And I still to this day point out the mini options as one of the few, if not the only examples I can think of in the long time that I've been doing this, where it seemed like everybody in the business was on board. Everybody was excited for the launch of mini options. You got to think leading into that period, 2012, going into 2013, we had Apple, which was, was the big dog back then, too. Everyone was trading Apple back then, just like they are today. Apple was approaching $700. And at the time, people were freaking out. Oh, my God, it's getting too expensive. We're going to see options volume take a hit as a result of this thing's just too expensive to trade. What can we do? What can we do to help bolster options volume in the future? So everyone got on board with the idea of these one-tenth size contracts. Exchanges were excited. Brokers were excited. Trading firms were excited. A new product to make markets on. It seemed like a no-brainer. This seemed like the slam dunk of slam dunks. I didn't hear a single negative word about these things. You can go back and check out our Options Insider radio show from that period, if you are so inclined. Listen to some of the conversations I have with people around that time. Everyone was uniformly ecstatic about these products. So when they launched in 2013, it seemed like, again, a home run. They launched them. It was very limited to start out. It wasn't on everything. It was just on five underlines. It was on Amazon, Apple, Spy, GLD, so gold. That's an interesting one, the gold ETF, and Goog. This is pre-alphabet listeners. <laughs> it was back when it was still Goog. And so those were the five underlines, which I guess you fast forward to today, they probably would do similar underlying say. Maybe they'd take GLD out of the mix. But outside of that, <laughs> that they probably would still have most of those names. Amazon would certainly be, and that's a very expensive name. Apple has done a split, so maybe not. But still, they're a popular one. And others, you could think of Tesla would probably still be in there. Uh, well, there would be in there. So a lot of names in there. What were these things now? These were one-tenth sized contract. So obviously your traditional equity option has a 100 multiplier listener. So every one contract you trade translates to 100 shares. Uh, these one tenth size were obviously a tenth. So every one contract translated to 10 shares. You can see the advantage of that. You know, it's obviously expensive stocks. They're not really buying round lots of 100 shares anymore. They're buying 10 or 20 or 50 or 70 or something along those lines. They're not buying a full hundred. So they can't even do a one lot of options. That means the options market is kind of off limits. To them, if they want to hedge, they want to generate income against it, whatever they want to do, they can't even do a one lot. So that made it very limited for people. Now, all of a sudden, people who had, let's say, 70 shares of Apple could come in and sell seven of these minis against it and actually generate some income on their portfolio. It seemed like a great thing. And so it made these expensive underlyings much more approachable for the small retail investor. And by December of 2013, they started doing decent paper, actually about 200,000 contracts ADV. Again, that's a one-tenth size contract, so maybe cut that by a tenth <laughs> to really get the actual real size, 20,000 real contracts. But still, that's nothing to sneeze at. It's something. They were, they were doing all right. And then kind of the whole thing fell apart by early to mid-2014. Uh, by May 2014, they were pretty much, the volume was kind of dried up. By the middle of that year, some exchange was starting to announce, hey, we're not going to list further series in these, which means they're effectively delisted. And by the end of that year, by the end of 2014, once the final series of them had expired, the exchanges were not listing anymore. So they were at that point, effectively delisted by the end of 2014. So it was a, it was a glorious, <laughs> glorious flame out in less than two years, really, for these products. How the hell is that possible? How do these super hot things go the way of the Dodo? Well, there were a bunch of th problems. First off, they were confusing for people. They had these kind of non-standard notations. So you see your regular Apple symbol. Then maybe next, I think you would see like an Apple 7, I think it was a ticker at the time. So it was a weird symbol. Brokers were having a hard time displaying it. They would display it maybe separately from the regular options. People had a hard time finding them. Or if they did see them, sometimes they thought they were trading the regular. But it was very confusing. So the, there was a, a UI problem and a symbology problem that confused people. Why is a one-tenth size contract delineated with a seven? Didn't really make any sense. Uh, also, everybody in the business thought this was a home run like I did. So they all got very greedy. Uh, brokers tried to charge full commissions for a one-tenth size contract. You know what? Back then, the average ticket charge was around eight bucks. It was about 75 cents a contract. So it was nothing to sneeze at. And customers aren't stupid. They know they're getting one tenth of effectively the bang for their buck on this contract. They're not spending full commissions. Of course not. So they rebelled against that. 
exchanges got greedy. They passed through effectively full exchange fees. They didn't try to minimize any of their fees uh, for these things. And the market makers who were so gung-ho about this thing, they really kind of backed off. They kind of played a wait-and-see game and said, let's see some volume materialize before we really commit to these things. So they made their markets ridiculously wide. Uh, and so what we happened, I actually pulled an example. This was up at the time, I believe, back on tab form. They pulled up how much more you were paying to trade a mini option versus a standard option. They pulled an example from Apple. This is probably around 2013, I believe. They said at the time, Apple underlying was trading at $90. So maybe this added, could have been later, actually, in 2014, because they had already split by that time. But Apple was trading $90. A standard options contract, they said, with a 90-strike weekly option, was trading 40 cents at 41 cents. So very tight, a penny-wide spread. The same mini option expiring in a week on the same 90-strike was trading with a bid-ask spread of 30 cents at 51. So pretty much a dime worse in either direction. That's a, that's a ton. That's a huge premium to trade these minis. So now you not only are you paying regular commissions for a one-tenth size contract. So if you want to do similar or analogous size to a regular, <laughs> regular contract, you're paying orders of magnitude more in commissions. You're also paying a whole bunch more in spreads. So you ended up, I think in their example, they calculated that the customer was paying 803% higher commission charges and 24% more in actual cost of the underlying in terms of bid off or spread slippage there. So it was just extremely expensive to trade these. So customers realized I'm not a fool. I'm just not going to trade them. Or if I can, I'm going to trade the regular size options. So Dan, it kind of seemed like it fell apart. It was a calamity of errors on everyone's part. Everyone got greedy. Everyone put their hands into the pie. And as a result, they killed it. Is that pretty much how you recall the the mini options debacle, sir? Yeah, I mean, it really is. You know, like people don't realize that a lot goes into uh, what they call like the, the job is called financial engineering, right? And a lot goes into it. You know, it's not just like, hey, what do you say we list options like this? OK, done. You know, like to to get them size right and and you know they're sized right i think but also to get a liquidity provider a market maker to to really buy into it and to get arbitrageurs to to trade the minis versus the full size uh you know because when arbitrageurs do that they're adding liquidity that forces markets to be tighter and then of course to get the brokers on board to not you know charge disproportionate commissions um, I think if a little bit of care is taken, I think that it can go a real long way and, and, and we can make them work. Um, and, and I think it would be a pretty good offering. I think that with the interest in options, especially the interest in like millennials, you know, the younger generation, folks who are younger and starting out and, and don't have, uh, you know, a big nest egg just yet. Uh, they're interested in options. They're real interested in options. And this can make a big difference to our industry. But, you know, it just takes a little bit of nuance. It takes a little bit of thinking about it. Yeah, the options market of today, 2021 versus back in 2013 or 2014, a completely different beast, particularly when it comes to the audience for this product, just overall volume wise. And look at the numbers of 2020. Obviously, 2020 was an aberrant year. But you're talking almost double what went up back in 2012 or 2013. So a lot more volume hitting the tape. More importantly for this product, a whole bunch more retail traders just hit the options market in 2020. A growth rate unlike anyone has ever really seen and ever really anticipated. And a lot of them coming on the smaller end of the spectrum, which, again, is the ideal use case for these products. Also, we're in a no commission. Well, I shouldn't really say no commission. That gets bandied around a lot. There are commissions. There are no ticket charges for options. So that means your gateway price to trading options is gone, which is nice. You're still paying roughly 60 cents a ticket or 60 cents a contract, less if you do more volume, obviously. But still, so there are commissions, but they are less. So that's a nice thing. That maybe eases the barrier to these where before it seemed like the broker's we're getting greedy. Whether they charge that full option rate for a mini, hopefully not. Hopefully we'll see some reduction in that as well. But it seems like we're in a perfect storm environment for a return, a revenge of the minis, if you will, Dan. Now, there's an interesting wrinkle to this, which comes up 
from a question from Tom. Tom asks, you know, I heard your interview. Uh, he's referring, I believe, to the interview I did with the folks from Gatsby a couple of weeks ago here on the network. Check it out if you're so inclined, listeners. Go to our full network if you have subscribed to it. Just go to our Options Insider radio program. That's our interview program on the network. A couple of weeks ago, we chatted with the folks from Gatsby. And as Tom mentioned, they brought up fractional options. And he says, I heard the talk about fractional options being issued by brokers. How would something like that work exactly? Now, that that is an interesting question. The second he brought that up, my gears started turning as well, Tom. I started thinking, hmm, how would that work exactly? Because <laughs> we see fractional shares out there right now. And those are very popular, big platforms like Robinhood's kicked it off. Pretty much every major broker offers it now. Schwab, Interactive Brokers, you name it. They all allow you to buy fractional amounts. I looked on Robinhood the other day. They let you buy as little as one one millionth of a share. I'm not sure what the actual value of one one millionth of a share, maybe outside of a piece of Berkshire Hathaway. Outside of that, buying one one millionth of anything, I'm not sure what the actual value is. But I think they're looking at it more from just a net dollar perspective. You're putting how much money you actually want to invest, and then they will allocate that amount for you. Dan, I'm not sure if you've been watching the fractional equity space, but do you have any thoughts on this? As Tom wants to know, how would something like a fractional option, how would that even work, Dan? Yeah, you know, I have not uh, talked to any of the folks I know at some of these brokerage firms who do this sort of stuff, but I imagine that, I mean, I imagine that the broker, I don't know, must allocate a single share among many people. But I mean, if it's not an even split, if they've got a half a share laying out there in the wind, especially if it's a share like Amazon, uh, you know, they could be on the hook for 1500 bucks. So, uh, you know, I, w- I would like to learn a little bit more about the mechanics. Um, and I, I guess I'm going to have to make a couple phone calls. Our listeners demand it, Dan. So uh, we go where the listeners will it. But yeah, you know, I, I was looking into this myself and they will do the sh- fractional shares real time, places like Robinhood and others. It's not like you're waiting till end of day to get your, your trades all put together. So they will allow you to allocate real time. You want to spend $50 on XYZ stock. They'll put it in for you, get a fraction or whatever that, that, that counts for there. Uh, now, there's a lot of questions, obviously, this brings to the fore though, when you're talking about options. I don't think, for example, that you'd be able to do a real time fractional option. That just doesn't really make sense for me. A stock is a stock. It's pretty easy to take it, to track it, to acquire it, to sell it, and also to break it up into component parts. It's pretty straightforward. You get a third of a share, you get a third of a share, you get it. Everyone's happy. If they want to get out of it, it's pretty liquid to get out of it. And you have enough of a pool of people all wanting to buy and sell the same thing to make it easy to get in and out of it. Options, not the same beast. Obviously, we have, look at, pick your underline, Tesla, Google, whatever the hell it is. There's thousands of strikes and series to look at. Not everyone's going to want a front month at the money call. Some guy's going to want a two month out, 5% out of the money call. Another person's going to want a three month out, 10% out of the money put. So aggregating all that demand, let alone doing it in a real time fashion, doesn't really seem to me to be very possible, at least in the near term. Also, everything in the options market is cleared. So the OCC has to stand behind the other side of that contract. I, I would love to get the OCC's thoughts on this. I'll have to reach out to them about that. Are they talking about this? Is this something they're going to clear on their end? Because otherwise, you've got effectively a bespoke brokerage product that the broker is standing behind. And then all of a sudden, your benefits of central clearing that you get in all the rest of the options market are gone. Because if broker X goes away, listeners, and they're the other side, they're the counterparty to your fractional options trade, then guess what? Your trade goes away. And so that's the nice thing about options. You don't have to worry about that. So are we going to add counterparty risk now to the world of options? That's not a good thing for anybody. Uh, we were talking about this on the option block a little bit earlier this week as well. I think Mr. Meatball pined in. He thought it would be some sort of value-weighted average price at the end of the day that maybe they would do. And that's certainly one approach to it. But I think any way this has to be done, it's going to have to be very limited, probably just around at the money and a few strikes around at the money in the front month, maybe a couple of other series. It would obviously have to be a very active series in order to have enough demand for X number of people to want to come in and buy a fraction of a call in, let's say, Tesla. Hot names like that, you might be able to get away with it. But outside of that, it doesn't seem like very possible at all. And then, of course, the nuances of being able to match that supply and demand. So you have three people each own a third of a call. 
What if one of them wants to get out and the other two want to stay in and you can't match the other side? Is the firm going to hold the bag on that other third of a call, Dan? You know, there's there's a lot of nuances to this that I think still need to be explored. So I think short answer to this is I don't think we're going to see fractional, despite what some of these brokerage firms are hinting at. I don't think we're seeing fractional options anytime soon. Is that your takeaway as well, Dan? You think maybe this is something that's going to explode into the mainstream in the very near future? Uh, yeah, it's tough to say. I mean, uh, there's so much innovate, innovation in our space over the last 15 years. It's just been incredible. Uh, 20 years, I guess I should say. It's just been incredible. Um, if they can figure out a way to do it that makes risk management sense for them, uh, that could be an innovation that really can grow their individual businesses as well as their industry as a whole. All right. So there's our kind of quick overview of the history of mini options. Hopefully that answers some of your questions. They are not e-mini S&P that we're talking about. We're talking about mini one-tenth size equity options. They were listed. They were just as quickly pretty much delisted for all the reasons we broke down here today. But I do think there is a specter of those returning in the near future. The additional wrinkle of the fractional, I'm not as optimistic about that. There are too many issues too many nuances that will have to be worked out in the near term for something like that to really make sense. I think the minis make a heck of a lot more sense. It's one contract. You could stand behind it. It's still cleared by OCC, so you have no counterparty risk. It's a much more straightforward, easily intelligible product that serves effectively the same purpose. If you have a viable mini options market, you don't need to mess around with fractionals and get into all that nonsense. So I think minis are definitely the way to go. I think we'll probably see those Hopefully, we'll see a return of those by the end of the year. That would be nice. But now, really quickly before we go, let's see if we can squeeze on a few more of you with a little bit of your mail call. Mail call. Time to look at questions submitted by our listeners. All right, everybody. Welcome to the mail call, the portion of the show where we break down your questions. Hopefully answer as many of them as we can. Dan, I know you get a lot of questions over there in the land of MTM as well. So what would you say, sir, was your MTM question of the week? Yeah, I I, um, I filled in for our head coach, John, this morning in our daily group coaching class where we talk about real specific individual trades. And uh, somebody asked, uh, it was one of our more advanced students, asked a really interesting question. And that was... Why would, well, I forget exactly how they phrase it, but basically, why would the higher strikes have a higher volatility than the lower strikes? Why would the vertical skew be reversed is a better way of saying that. And we've been seeing this, well, I've been seeing this a lot more often than I've just casually observed it in the past. I mean, I don't have any hard number studies that would uh, that would confirm that, but I mean, it used to be when I'm trading, I'm going through stocks, it would be like, oh, once a week, oh, wow, you know, this stock has, you know, the the higher strikes have higher vol- IV than the lower strikes. That's weird. Now, I mean, I find several a day. It's very, very interesting. And so the answer to that question is, well, let's first talk about why skew is normal, uh, where the lower strikes have higher implied volatility. People typically buy puts to protect against stocks falling. So buy those lower strike puts and they tend to sell calls because they're selling covered calls to generate income. Now, of course, out of the money puts are synthetically equal to in the money calls and out of the money calls are synthetically equal to in the money puts. And so it doesn't matter here if we're talking about calls or puts. It's really high strike versus low strike. So that's why the skew exists normally, why normal skew exists, but why would it be reversed? And a lot of that has to do with people coming in and looking for really explosive moves to the upside. We see this a lot of the time in short squeeze candidates where it frankly doesn't matter if you're overpaying a little bit for implied volatility because if the stock goes up 200%, you're going to make a crap ton of money on Delta and GAM anyway. So it just doesn't matter. And, and, and that's the reason. It's just this demand. It's just this demand for calls in certain names 
And some of it might be overzealous. And, and sometimes when I see that, I actually take the other side and I start selling calls or call spreads. But um, it makes for interesting trading. It makes for interesting trading to follow along or, or to fade and, and trade against what we see. Yeah, those kind of things are, are very nice to, you know, aggressively fade. A lot of times if they're going to be nice enough to bid up the far out of the money call skew in the name like Tesla or a game or whatever else it is, and you still have some sort of optimistic outlook on the underlying, then a nice vertical call spread is a great way to take advantage of that because you're buying something at the money. It's going to be inflated, but not percentage wise as inflated as that far out of the money stuff. Now you're able to sell what people are bidding up and take advantage of the bid and effectively get into verticals at usually much cheaper prices than you probably could earlier. So that's a great way to take advantage of these types of things. And we're seeing more of these popping up now, you know, the meme stocks and everything else, things are starting to get bid up from an upside call skew perspective. So if that's the case, that makes it attractive. Or if you have the underlying turn around and sell a covered call against, there's a lot of ways you could take advantage of this bid they give you in the implied volatility skew. Right, let's do one more here, Dan. Let's go back to, this is one of our regular listeners. This is Baiju, Baiju Thomas. He says, hi, Mark. My question is specific to portfolio margin that brokers have. Here's the scenario. I am long 100 Apple stock on day one. Then on day five, I decide to short one call above the day five spot price. He puts in parentheses a covered call. Yeah, we're with you so far, Baiju. My question is, will my broker acknowledge my long stock and not charge me an initial margin for the named call? I ask because stock options are with OCC and the stock can be executed at any exchange. So with the portfolio margin calculator that is owned by the broker, can they portfolio margin my account to give me any long stock benefit? Unlike, say, a span where the futures and options are at the same exchange, so span margin does give margin benefit between holding futures and options at the same time for the same instrument. Thanks, as always. Yeah, span's a little bit of a different beast. By just, obviously, you're talking about things that are going up on CME, where they're, you're right, they're the exchange and kind of the clearinghouse all wrapped into one. So that makes it a little bit different. But for the purposes of this show and for a lot of our listeners, portfolio margin on equity options is kind of what you're referring to. Dan, you want to? Help set this record straight here for Baiju on who owns that portfolio margin. Like, where's that determination coming from? And will they use it to offset your positions? Yeah. In, in times like this, when somebody's asking a very specific question about how their broker margins them, I, I'm going to answer the question, but first I'm going to qualify it a little bit and disclaim it a little bit because here's how that works the OCC sets up margin rules, all right, whether it's Reg T or portfolio. And then the clearing firms beneath them, Apex or whoever it is, they have their own rules that could be uh, more restrictive, but not less restrictive than the OCC. And then the broker may have further more restrictive rules. Uh, and so to get the, the the right answer, an accurate answer, you would you would actually have to call your broker. And uh, if it's somebody with a good customer service desk, it shouldn't take too long to get that answer. Th that said, the way I think it should work and probably does work is be, if it's portfolio margining, it shouldn't really matter like whether they match them up or not, because they're just taking, uh, you know, like the risk of that underlying and, and all the options in that underlying moving a certain amount or like, what, 25 bucks uh, for each option, uh, something like that. Again, your broker will know the actual specific answer, but I don't think it should be an issue. I mean, I think that that if I'm understanding the, the question correctly, yeah, your broker is going to know, OK, you know this call goes with this stock and and it doesn't really matter because they're going to margin it up in an extremely liberal way anyway. That's what portfolio margining is. You are correct, sir. Yeah, Baiju, portfolio margin is not something you get automatically at most brokerage firms. You have to kind of apply for it. So it's already something you're going to be you know, proactively asking for. Usually they have minimums like 100000 in your account to qualify for it. So when you're getting portfolio margin, they're agreeing to give you a lot of these offsetting positions. So something basic like a covered call, if you already have portfolio margin, any decent broker, they shouldn't be holding aside any sort of extra margin for the call. They should understand that those two are offsetting positions. A smaller broker where you don't have a portfolio margin account, maybe they're not as savvy 
in the option space, yeah, maybe they could do all sorts of crazy things. You don't know. But a larger broker understands the options market. You've already qualified for a portfolio margin account, which means you're going to get those offsets. That's one of the things you get with portfolio margin. Yeah, you should be all set. I wouldn't worry about the differing clearing here and there, stock versus options. It all goes through the broker, and the broker is going to offset you. So you're good there. Good question, by Good question. Everybody out there who's obsessed with minis and fractionals. We've got someone listening live here, Renko, saying, Small investors are not able to participate in option trading for stocks such as Amazon due to its very high prices. There should be equality in the markets. Fraction trading would be great for small investors for such high-priced stocks. Yeah, on the stock side, I'm with you. On the option side, I think we agree. Mini options are probably the the better way to go, at least for the near term. And certainly for a lot of you out there, mini options solve a lot of the problems that fractionals do without any of the inherent headaches and questions that fractionals bring to the table. But great questions, great comments, everyone out there. Dan, before we go, if folks are intrigued, maybe they want to join the party over there so they can be featured in the MTM question of the week. Where should they go? What should they do? You know, we actually just uh, had a couple of webinars where we were making our group coaching class available uh, to folks for uh, a, like this incredible trial price. It was 99 bucks for a full month. I mean, you know, practically riskless, really. Uh, and if you go to markettaker.com slash 99, market, like stock market, taker, like take what is rightfully yours, two T's in a row, markettaker.com slash 99, you can join our daily group coaching class and you'll be in that class every single day from 9 to 10 Central. It's 10 to 11 Eastern, one hour. And our head coach, John, who's a former Goldman guy, he's going to literally give you trade ideas every single day. And uh, it's really it, it's really an incredible class. There you go. Market Taker 2 tscom is the place to go. To begin your journey, on behalf of Mr. Dan and our friends over there at Demand Derivative, check them out. Their crowdfunding is still running. You guys like to invest in all sorts of interesting fintech things these days. This is an interesting fintech startup opportunity in the volatility market. What could be hotter than that? So head on over to Demand Derivatives, two Ds this time, not two Ts, (laughs) and check it out for yourself. Click on the crowdfunding portal to begin your adventure. Only $105 minimum. It's really small. They want to make sure everyone can participate in this. And of course, on behalf of myself as well, I want to thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, subscribing, for listening live, for sending in such great questions. Keep them coming. And we'll see you back here next Education Wednesday for another episode of Options Bootcamp. This episode is sponsored by Demand Derivatives, a startup futures exchange and clearinghouse trading the world's major assets in a creative new way. You already trade on an exchange. Here is your chance to own one. Before they approach large strategic partners for funding, the pioneering team at Demand Derivatives launched a crowdfunding portal so that regular traders have the chance to buy shares. Learn more and become a part of this revolutionary fintech project now at demandderivatives.com slash crowdfunding. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs>